Hello and welcome to this video on the interactionist perspective of crime and deviance. So far we have looked at theories which accept the official definitions of crime and deviance. They also accept official crime figures as mostly accurate. Unlike functionalism, interactionism or labelling theory looks at how and why some people or activities are labelled as criminal or deviant, whilst other people or activities are not. Crime and deviance for interactionists therefore equals a social construction created through social interactions. That is to say, we create the concepts of crime and deviance. It is therefore less about wider forces and more about individual interactions. It is more of a micro approach rather than a macro approach, as we saw with functionalism. The starting point for interactionists is this statement, that no act is criminal or deviant in of itself, but rather it is the act of labelling something which makes it so. So simply performing an act is not in of itself criminal or deviant. It takes someone else to come along and say, that's criminal or that's deviant in order for it to be considered as such. Here we're beginning with the work of Howard Becker, who argued that social groups create deviance by creating the rules whose infraction, that is breaking, constitutes deviance, and by applying those rules to particular people and labelling them as outsiders as a result of this behaviour. For Becker and interactionists, a deviant is simply someone who has been labelled as so. So the question is, how do laws and rules get made, therefore, in the first place? Well, Becker argues it follows a fairly simple process. It begins with a group of individuals known as moral entrepreneurs. These are people who in our society are concerned or worried or nervous about changes in society, or they perceive criminality and deviance as occurring or as a growing threat in society. A good example of a moral entrepreneur might be parents. They therefore begin a crusade that is a mission to see new laws created or new rules introduced and then policed in the belief that it will benefit, in particular, vulnerable groups in society and to those whom it is applied. So going back to the example of parents, they may be concerned about their children, their young people, and may be wanting to protect them in some way. Ultimately, as a result of these new rules and these new laws, this leads to the creation of new outsiders and deviants, and therefore empowers social control agencies such as the police to police their behaviours. An example could be the concept of juvenile delinquents, young people committing small acts of antisocial behaviour or criminality or deviance. In the Victorian period, there was a campaign by upper class Victorian moral entrepreneurs, mainly parents, wanting to protect young people. This ultimately led the state to establish juvenile courts. These were courts primarily aimed at dealing with young people and their behaviour. The state therefore extended powers to the police, to police young people, and to begin to police what we might refer to today as status offences, offences which offend or harm an individual's status within society, such as promiscuity, that is sexual lewdness, and truancy, that is failing to turn up to school, or maybe perhaps thinking about the Victorian period, turn up to work on time. Becker then brought this to the more modern period and looked at other examples. He argued that social control agencies actually also like to campaign for changes to the law because they quite like having power. And whilst they have power already, they always seek to acquire more. So an example of this could be in the United States, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which focuses on policing the drugs trade, campaigned for the Marijuana Tax Act to be introduced in 1937. Prior to this, marijuana was not illegal, and actually a derivative of marijuana known as hemp was part of a large agricultural industry in the United States, which would soon be devastated as a result of the introduction of this tax act. The aim of the act was to protect young people. There was lots of concern, in particular amongst white middle-class America, that young people, often young women, were experimenting with marijuana, and this was causing them to break the law, and in particular, engage in promiscuity. 
In reality, the reason why the Federal Bureau of Narcotics engaged in this campaign was to expand its sphere of influence, that is, to gain more powers. Therefore, what Becker is showing us here is that it's not the inherent harmfulness of a behaviour that leads to new laws. It's worth remembering that at that point in time, there were no recorded cases of an individual dying as a result of, say, an overdose of marijuana, but rather the efforts of powerful individuals. And especially if we were to compare this, say, to the impact of something such as alcohol, there might be a stronger argument <coughs> excuse me, for making that perhaps illegal rather than marijuana. We then therefore need to consider who exactly gets labelled in our society, because not everyone who commits an offence is labelled. It depends on a range of factors. For example, the previous interactions an individual may have had with social control agencies, such as the police and the courts, their appearance, their background and their biography, the situation and circumstances of the offence. All of this is going to feed into whether or not an individual is labelled or not. Agencies of social control are more likely to label certain groups, we find. They often act on what we call typifications. So, for example, police decisions to arrest a young person are often based on physical appearance and where they are located. As those, that is, antisocial behaviour orders, are disproportionately applied in the United Kingdom to, for example, ethnic minorities and to young men and to the working class. This then brings us to the work of Aaron Sikorel, who talked about the negotiation of justice. What we find is, is that police have in their mind typifications or typifications or stereotypes of what they think a criminal looks like and how a criminal behaves. As a result, they police certain areas in our society more than others, thinking that that's where they're going to find these criminals. When inevitably that happens and young people are picked up, or the working classes are picked up, or black Asian minority ethnic individuals are picked up by the police and taken to a police station and accused of having committed some act of crime or deviance, we find an interesting outcome occurs. If that child is middle class, their parents will often turn up to the police station and plead on their behalf and will be able to negotiate their child out of justice. That is, they explain to the police, oh, he would never do this normally. She's a really good student. They've got a great future ahead of them. Please don't hurt them. Please don't harm them. Please don't undermine their efforts. I'm sure they'll never do it again. We'll punish them ourselves. And the police are very likely to go, well, it's a one-off. You're middle class. You know what to do. We'll let you go. And we often find that things such as being able to use the elaborated code will feed into this as well. Whereas, in the scenario where it's a working class individual who's been picked up, working class parents are less likely to attend the police station, are far more likely to believe that perhaps, to an extent, the young person deserves to be caught. And so, as a result, they're more likely to watch as the police deal with this person and process them, and ultimately may see them punished as a result. We need, therefore, to consider the effects of labelling. Arguably, by labelling someone deviant or criminal, you increase the likelihood of such behaviour. This, of course, is the self-fulfilling prophecy. Edwin Lemmert did some work on this area, and he identifies two different types of deviants. Firstly, primary deviants. These are acts which are not publicly labelled. They often go unnoticed. They are widespread and fairly meaningless, and they're carried out by lots of people. A good example of this could be fair dodging on a train, or perhaps dropping a piece of litter, or potentially even urinating in public. All of these are considered fairly low-level forms of crime or deviance, and sadly, most people in our society have probably engaged in one of those behaviours at least once in their life. However, we often see this as a moment of madness. I can't believe I've done it. I've never normally behaved that way. And as a result, society does not label that person, but also the person does not self-identify now as a criminal or a deviant. But as we know, some deviance is noticed and labelled by society, and being caught leads to shame and humiliation. Once an individual is labelled so, it can change what is known as their master status. This is how they view themselves. It's their identity. And so as a result, they no longer see themselves as a good citizen, as a member of a family unit, or perhaps as a good friend or a student. They now see themselves as maybe a thief, a junkie, a paedophile, or so on. This leads to self-identification as a deviant and can lead again to the self-fulfilling prophecy. That is, labelling someone deviant or criminal, as a result, you increase the likelihood of such behaviour. And so here we're talking about secondary deviants, acting out a label, becoming an outsider, 
provoking a hostile reaction from society. This could lead to what we call a deviant career. Once one self-identifies as a deviant, one starts to think, well, this is my lot in life, this is how I'm going to behave, and so a career begins. It could even lead to an individual joining a deviant subculture, that is, spending time or hanging out with other individuals who engage in a similar behaviour. And we might see the creation, for example, of an alternative status hierarchy there too. The work of Lemmert and Young shows how it is not the acting of itself, but rather the hostile reaction which causes deviance. Social control agencies actually therefore cause deviance in themselves in this fashion, despite seeking to uphold law-abiding behaviour. If social control agencies such as the police did not engage in typification, stereotypes and labelling, perhaps we would see less crime and deviance. But labelling, as we know, is not inevitable. We have to remember that ultimately not all labels are fully communicated. Sometimes individuals don't realise that they have been labelled, and sometimes people reject the label. So there is a role here for free will and personal choice. Next, we need to consider the work of Stanley Cohen, who identified the process of deviance amplification and the deviancy amplification spiral. The deviance amplification spiral is a term used to describe a process in which the attempt to control deviance actually leads to an increase in the level of overall deviance. This leads to greater attempts in particular by the state and social control agencies to control it, and in turn, this produces yet higher levels of deviance. More and more control, therefore, produces more and more deviance in an escalating spiral or snowballing feedback process. Perhaps the most famous example of the deviancy amplification spiral is that of the mods and rockers, and this could be used to explain the amplification spiral of deviance. What occurred was a moral panic which received press exaggeration, leading to a growing concern with moral entrepreneurs and calling for a crackdown. The police responded by arresting more youths and imposing higher penalties upon them for engaging in antisocial behaviour. This seemed to confirm the truth of the original media reaction and provoked more public concern in an upward spiral of deviance amplification. At the same time, the demonising of the mods and the rockers of young people as folk devils caused further marginalisation of these groups and resulted in yet more deviant behaviour on their part. If we need to visualise the deviancy amplification spiral, we can use this image here. And you may want to pause now to copy this down. It begins, of course, with a deviant act, so the original act of deviancy, ultimately leading to it being defined as a crime. The news will then pick up upon this and begin to report it and starts to portray it in a particular way. This ultimately leads perhaps to a deviancy amplification as more and more people become aware of the original act and begin to perhaps engage in copycat processes. Ultimately, therefore, we therefore see a moral panic occur, in particular amongst moral entrepreneurs. The state will then jump in and begin to intervene, giving new powers to the police and a crackdown occurs and ultimately the process will begin again. In terms of labelling and criminal justice policy, there is a new and increasing tendency to see young offenders as evil and to be less tolerant of minor deviance. Increased violence amongst young people has led to even more stigmatisation of them. And we can look at prime examples such as the perceived rise in knife crime and how the media has dealt with this. Labelling theory is important for policy creation. If labelling pushes people towards deviant careers, then logically it is better to have fewer rules to break, one would argue. So this has led some interactionists and other sociologists and policymakers to argue that perhaps, for example, we should decriminalise soft drugs. As a result of doing that, that would reduce the number of individuals, in particular young people with convictions, and end the naming and shaming culture and may stop the deviancy application spiral in its tracks. On this theme, there has been discussions about how would be best to punish people without engaging in this labelling process. And this is where we come across reintegrative shaming and the work of John Braithwaite, who argues for a positive role in the labelling process in future. And he identifies two types of current labelling and shaming. That is disintegrative shaming, where both the crime and the criminal is labelled as bad, and the criminal is ostracised, that is kicked out, as it were, or excommunicated from society. Whereas he believes that this should be replaced with reintegrative shaming, where we label the act, but not the actor. As a result, we would be recognising the bad act that has occurred, 
but it provides an opportunity for the individual who committed that act to earn back trust and to show that they are truly sorry. It prevents negative labelling and therefore secondary deviance, breaking, one would hope, the self-fulfilling prophecy cycle and indeed the deviancy amplification cycle as well. When it comes to evaluating interactionism and labelling theories, a number of key points here. Whilst it shows that the law is not fixed, but constructed and interpreted by individuals who are human, and as a result there is going to be subjectivity and variation there, it also shows that law is often enforced unevenly, and perhaps the law comes down in a more heavy-handed fashion on some groups rather than others. It also shows that society's attempts to control deviance can lead to deviance amplification. However, arguably labelling theory is far too deterministic, that is to say that it believes that once an individual has been labelled, they are somewhat doomed to act out that label, when we know, as previously stated, this is not always the case. Furthermore, labelling arguably provides the criminal victim status, which ignores the real victims of crime. By assuming that offenders passively accept labelling, it ignores the fact that some actively choose deviance. So again, maybe we need to think about the role of free will here. It does not explain why people undertake primary deviance before being labelled in the first place. If we know it's wrong, if we know it's breaking the rules, why do we do it? It implies that without labelling, deviance wouldn't exist. But many are aware that they are breaking social norms when being deviant. And perhaps we can bring in a bit of functionalism here and say that, well, to be honest, crime and deviance has been in every single human society and civilization throughout history. Perhaps it's normal, natural and inevitable. Whereas Marxists would argue that interactionists fail to account for the source or origin of labels or take into account wider power structures. So the question here is who gets to label? And Marxists would probably argue it's the bourgeoisie who control the state. That's it. Thank you very much.